Welcome and thank you for joining us for another edition of the Youth Intervention Journal here on North Metro TV. The Youth Intervention Journal is a collaboration between North Metro TV and the Youth Intervention Programs Association, commonly referred to as YIFA. And we're joined again to, uh, to start uh, this episode again with Paul Manier, uh, Director of Services for Minnesota YIFA. And Paul, thanks for being here again. My pleasure, Ben. It's always great to be here. And today we're going to dive into the topic of youth homelessness and how that affects the community and uh, how different organizations uh, that YIPA works with are coming alongside of homeless youth and uh, helping them uh, break out of that cycle of homelessness and uh, on the road to recovery. And uh, we're going to dis discuss more of that in detail as we go throughout today's show. But something I want to discuss with you first about, um, about YIPA is one of the big things you guys do is education, kind of, and a lot of professional development. Kind of explain your role there and, and uh, what you see YIPA's role there being. Sure, glad to explain that. Um, YIPA basically does three things. Um, we do different kinds of advocacy work. We do legislative advocacy and public relations advocacy. And then the third arm of YIPA essentially is professional development. So we have organizations throughout the state that all work with youth in different sort of ways in terms of youth intervention, depending on the program that they're in. Mm -hmm. But there's a common variable that everybody needs to have current trends, most best practices that are uh, you know, people are using that are finding good results. So we spend a lot of time making sure the youth intervention workers throughout the state of Minnesota are getting high quality trainings. Mm -hmm. And why do you think education is so important? Uh, and why has that become such a you know, vital piece to your organization? Well, first of all, some people just have to do it because of their licensure mm -hmm. requirements. They have to get continuing education units. But a bigger picture than that, Ben, is that any program is really only as good as its least trained staff. Mm. And if you have people that are interfacing with youth that really aren't skilled at understanding where the youth are at or have the ability to have empathy or have the technical skills to know how to work with them, they can cause damage. Not mm. only can they not do good, uh, but they could actually cause harm to that youth. So making sure that all the youth intervention workers throughout the state of Minnesota is really how we get the best bang for our buck. Okay. And uh, I know you have uh, sessions happening all the time and classes mm -hmm. happening all the time. And uh, appropriately enough for this show, it looks like you have an upcoming session on youth homelessness. Kind of talk to us about some of the different topics, including that one that you guys cover in these training sessions. Absolutely. We're really excited about our Twin Cities uh, Regional Conference coming up on September 25th. Um, it's, it's about youth homelessness. It's a growing trend. And... Um, and as you'll hear later on today in the show, it's a, it's a real serious problem that I think needs a lot of attention. And we're putting on a really unique conference, I think. Uh, whether youth intervention workers work with kids in rural areas, suburban areas, or urban areas, we're going to have a breakout session that is going to address the needs of those particular kids within that geographical area. So we're trying to do whatever we can, not only to work with the youth once they become homeless, but the vast majority of us who work in youth intervention field work with kids that are in a high-risk population for becoming homeless. So we have to make sure that we train everybody, not just the people that work with homeless youth once they get, once they get homeless, which you'll see some real experts mm -hmm. on the show today, but also how do we know and identify those kids that are in situations that are really likely to place them in jeopardy of someday becoming homeless. And we're starting to learn what those variables are mm -hmm. And if people who work with these kids know how to intervene and help their families or get them hooked up to resources, we can stop a lot of these kids and reverse the trend of youth homelessness. So uh, we're excited for that training coming up. And they, people can find out more about yeah. all of our trainings on our website. It's uh, www.mnyipa.org or minyipa.org. Okay. And these trainings and uh, conferences, are they only for YIPA member organizations? Can anyone attend these? How does that work? Yeah, they're open to the public. Yeah. Um, people who come there are varied. Uh, we mm -hmm. have some parents come sometimes, a lot of school personnel, and just people who work with kids in general tend to come. And you do not have to be a YIPA member to be able to attend our trainings. But there's a big advantage if you are a YIPA member, right. we have a discounted rate. And we generally provide the best in class trainings throughout the state of Minnesota with all these different youth intervention topics. And if you are a member, you get a reduced rate. Generally, it's about 25% of the registration fee. And one of the things that I think 
and it's important to point out here, mm -hmm. is that we do everything we possibly can to keep our registrations as low as possible because the goal of YIPA, even though we, as an organization, we don't work directly with youth, we serve the youth organizations that do. And so I, the way that we can touch youth is on a macro level. Mm -hmm. And if we get more people coming to our trainings and getting the most recent um, research and up-to-date best practices, then they're going to go have better results. So we do whatever we can to reduce the rates. And I think if people looked at our prices, they would find out we're super competitive and we have high quality trainings. Okay. And at these at these trainings, what can people expect if you know people are coming to them? Are they gonna? Is it uh, you know lots of different speakers? Do you bring in people from around the country to speak at these? How how does what does a typical training session look like? Great question. Each one of them is just radically different depending mm -hmm. on what the topic is and what the needs are. Um, it, it can be. We sometimes we bring in national speakers. We've got one coming up where. It's a play that was written and acted out by youth on bullying coming up in November where we're collaborating with Anoka Ramsey Community College on that one. Um, so it can take on many forms. The one that we're going to be doing on September 25th for mm -hmm. Youth Homeless is bringing in local experts. We're, we are not flying in anybody from anywhere. We're bringing people that are in the state of Minnesota that are skilled workers and have good, hardcore, practical experience and good outcomes of working with this youth intervention worker. So for this particular one, there's going to be a series of uh, different speakers, but mm -hmm. they're all local people who are experts in their field. And again, where people can find more information about all of this? They can go to our website, uh, www.minyipa.org, or they can find us on Facebook, mm -hmm. facebook.com slash youth intervention. We put all our trainings on there, and people can follow us that or, there or on Twitter. So we do whatever we can to help get the word out. Well, thanks. That's interesting and uh, looking forward. And I hope those uh, all the training sessions go well, and especially the one on September 25th dealing with youth homelessness. So thanks for sharing that information with us today. You're welcome, Ben. And when we come back, we're going to dive more into our discussion of youth homelessness. So sh be sure to stick around here on the Youth Intervention Journal. Fran Sorensen. I am an artist. I am an educator and I have been educating students for 25 years. I am also a collector. I collect salt and pepper shakers. I collect postcards. I collect rocks and I write on the bottom of all my rocks telling where they're from and who they're from. I love square dancing. I make my own TV shows free at North Metro TV and I love it. Get started by signing up for free TV production classes at 763-231-2803 or eric at northmetrotv.com. Oh, those boys are much too much. Those boys are much too much. We got the spirit. We're hot. We can't be stopped. We got the spirit. We're hot. We can't be stopped. We're going to beat them and bust them. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Join Ben Hale and Danica Peterson every Friday on North Metro TV News. Welcome back to the Youth Intervention Journal, and we'll continue our discussion now on youth homelessness. And we're going to talk with Dr. Heather Hughesby, who is the Executive Director of YouthLink. And uh, first of all, welcome to the program. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Ben, for having me. And uh, let's just, I just want to know, tell people what YouthLink is and kind of what your mission is in the community. Well, Ben, um, thank you. Our mission in um, the community is to be the place where um, the doors of opportunity for homeless youth are opened and the place where we can help those youth to reframe their stories so that they can end up to have the tools necessary to live a life of um, stability and a life with education and a life with um, employment. So um, we're there to really help youth. Um, not Some people will say, you know, why can't they just pull up their bootstraps? Well, we're there to help mm -hmm. youth 
to find their bootstraps, mm. to find the way that they can pull those up so that they can become productive members of our community as well. How big of a problem is youth homelessness in uh, the Twin Cities area in Minnesota? Uh, what is the type of, what is the size and scope of this problem that you're trying to tackle? Well, regretfully, um, youth homelessness um, is, on an, is on the rise. In the state of Minnesota, on any given night, there's about 2,500 um, homeless youth who are unaccompanied, meaning not with families, um, anywhere from the ages of 14 to 21 or 23. Um, in, the, in Minneapolis itself, in Twin Cities, we have over 650 young people every night that are experiencing homelessness. Um, in the recent um, study that was done, the most recent Wilder study on homelessness, there's been a, almost a 40% increase mm -hmm. in the number of young people who are homeless on the streets. Mm -hmm. And so YouthLink um, has, been, um, has, has seen that rise. Um, in our drop-in center alone um, this year, we will have seen close to 3,000 homeless young oh. people um, who are unaccompanied. In other words, they're not connected with families. Are there specific reasons that you can point to for this increase in this problem? Well, I think there's several things, um, Ben. You know, partly is that um, certainly the economy has had an impact, mm -hmm. and people are and young people aren't able to stay with families, or they've been displaced, and they're mobile, highly mobile. Um, certainly, the um, the 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 home itself has been um, an issue for these young people. Most of the young people have come from some type of a an abusive home. Um, they've, been, um, they've been the victims of violence. Uh, they may have been in out-of-home placements in foster care. Um, they could have been on, their families could have been homeless. We've seen generational um, impact on homelessness. Our goal, though, at YouthLink is we feel that we're the last stop. Mm -hmm. We feel that these are the young people on the, on the, at the crossroads and that if we can catch them now, that we can prevent them from being long-term homeless um, or worse, not, not um, losing their lives or even being um, unfortunately caught up with the law. Okay. What are some of the uh, strategies and tactics and things that you put into place to, as you said earlier, help these, uh, these youth find the bootstraps? What are things that you're doing for them? Well, one of the things that we've done at YouthLink, YouthLink's been around for over 30 years, mm -hmm. and one of the things is that we take youth for where they're at. Where they're at. Um, we have a, a center at 41 North 12th Street, um, that center, though, is also now home to the Youth Opportunity Center, which is a collaborative of the community, and we have 22 different partners on site, all of us there to meet the needs of where the youth are at, at the point that they enter our drop-in center. Mm. So we're using a much more collective approach. We're coming to the youth instead of the youth having to search all over the city for services. We do um, street outreach with our street outreach program. Um, we're out in the community. But the most important thing is that we're a safe place, we're a place that's non-judgmental, where for the first time a youth can come to our center and be who they are, get themselves stabilized, their basic needs met, and then we can work with them on what the other kinds of interventions they need, whether it's education, employment, clean clothes, a hot meal, um, but it's the first place that they have where they can find trusting adults and role models for themselves. So it sounds like your organization is more than just a, a cot to sleep on for a night and maybe, you know, one meal. It sounds like you really do, you know, try and meet a full range of needs for folks. Absolutely. Every young person that's homeless comes in with their own needs and their own issues. They're complex. Um, YouthLink does not have at our site a shelter or shelter beds, but we work collaboratively with our partners in the community um, and there are shelter beds that we get the youth to. There's not enough in the community. But we also, um, yes, we assess the youth, every youth that comes in, to determine what their needs are. And our goal is to get them and to navigate them directly to the needs, whether it's health, whether it's a legal issue, whether it's an education issue, an employment issue. Um, whatever it is, we're going to get the youth to that, and we're going to help navigate them so they can find the tools that they need to um, really, really take care of themselves and be self-sufficient themselves. And I saw that you, you mentioned it briefly there, but uh, just looking around your website, I saw that you um, a lot of times meet the um, medical health needs and also uh, are looking to meet mental health needs of uh, individuals that come into your care. Absolutely, we have a clinic on site, Healthcare for the Homeless is on site, and so they're one of our 22 partners. 
We have also, we have a mental health team that's part of the YouthLink staff, but we also bring in other providers and we make referrals out to the community. We're the place that a youth will come, a homeless youth, they'll feel safe, but then we can work with them to be connected to the places that they need to go. Mm -hmm. There certainly are mental health issues. Um, these are young people who have been through significant trauma, um, significant abuse. They've been sexually exploited. They've been in abusive relationships. They've been taken advantage of. But the one thing about them is they come into the center and they want to try to get themselves stabilized and they want to try to get themselves into um, in a life that has some of the same hopes and dreams that we have, uh, all of us. How can people in the community come alongside YouthLink? How can people help you? Well, I think number one is that any anytime that they want to know more and learn more about who these young people are, who are probably they're standing shoulder to shoulder with in the community, we'd love them to visit YouthLink at 41 mm -hmm. North 12th Street. We'd also love them to volunteer. There's great opportunities to volunteer as tutors. There's opportunities to help um, make a meal or help with our clothing closet. We need clothes and, and um, supplies for young people, hygiene products. So there's m multiple ways that people can help. Um, their support, being a voice for us, learning more about us, and, and we'd love to have people come and visit, visit the center and we can show them what we're doing. And I'm sure people can find all that information on your website too of how they can get involved and visit your, where to visit. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. YouthLinkMN.org. Mm -hmm. If you visit there, you can find out all that's needed and there's phone numbers. And we, we really encourage um, the community to join in partnership with us. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Heather Hughesby, for coming in sharing about YouthLink and uh, telling us about what sounds like a great organization. So thanks for being here today. Thanks for what you're doing, Ben. All right. Well, when we come back, we'll continue our discussion on youth homelessness. Stay with us on the Youth Intervention Journal. Everyone has friends. There's online friends. Friends to go out with on a Saturday night. Friends to hang out with and do nothing friends who show up on moving day. And then there are the friends who'll be there if someone is dealing with a mental illness. Are you one of those friends? I'm lucky. Let me help you with that. I get to do something I love. It has nothing to do with touchdowns or titles. Everybody bring it in. I get to play a part in the life of someone just starting out. How many of you think homework is just as important as teamwork? I help keep kids in school. Good. And that's the name of the game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt. I live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Take out meals for just $12.99. Call it. Sherry Pearson. the sole surviving heir of the King of Montanopolis, and you are now worth $45 million. I'm rich! It can't be real. Of course it's not real. Come on. Having money isn't about luck. Like that takeout meal. Cook at home instead, you can save thousands a year. Feed me. Feed the pig! Okay, this time, I'm gonna do it. I'm going to actually go to school. Tell me about some of the stuff you've had to deal with. I just dropped out completely. I just got caught up in it, the whole scene with the alcohol and the drugs. I was arrested. A lot of my friends, they were really concerned, especially my friend Aaron. You just have to find someone. They don't have to tell you advice. They don't have to do that. They just listen. Give your friends the boost they need to graduate. Join us at boostup.org. Welcome back to the Youth Intervention Journal, and now we're going to continue our discussion on youth homelessness, and we're joined now by Marnie Thomas and Maria Zerbe. And uh, uh, Marnie, why don't you just start and kind of tell us what's your role with uh, YouthLink and uh, how long you've been uh, involved in this organization? Sure. Thanks so much for having us, Ben. Um, I have actually had the privilege to be at YouthLink for over 10 years, um, and currently my role is the Youth Opportunity Center Manager. So I manage all of the partnerships. Um, that YouthLink has with community members. Okay, yeah. and uh, what is it about this, uh, this work that keeps you coming back, that has kept you involved in it for 10 years? Yeah. Well, you know, I think first and foremost, it's the young people that I get to work with every day. Um, it's definitely the mission of what we're doing. I think YouthLink does really important work in helping young people 
kind of help discover who they are and help them become, you know, support or people in the community that are successful. And um, I mean, definitely getting to work with people like Maria every day, it, it brings a smile to my face and um, I get to laugh every day. <laughs> And, and Maria, uh, you've been a client of, of for, with YouthLink, and kind of yeah. tell us your story and uh, what brought you to YouthLink, and uh, kind of how your relationship with them uh, uh, has evolved over time. Yeah, um, thank you very much for having us here. Um, I actually started going to YouthLink two years ago. I did an intake, you know, felt around it, wasn't really liking it. Um, this year, I became homeless in February. Um, lived downtown in the shelter, ended up visiting YouthLink again, did another intake. And, you know, it was like, it was kind of a way for me to sit there and, you know, figure out what YouthLink was about and what the resources they had for me that I could use, you know, in the future. And to be honest, it's like, it's, it's like a home to me, a second home to me. The staff there are very, you know, very warming, they're, they're understanding, they listen. Um, also the different activities that we do such as like culture clubs, the GED that they provide, um, the home cook kind of like youth meals that they have, um, different atmosphere of youth that come through there and youth staff as well and the providers and volunteers that come through. So um, it's it's a really cool like experience for me, especially with the situation most youth that go through days. Um, but I think that YouthLink Opportunity Center is like one of the best things that, you know, that can get youth to have resources and to learn things about themselves as well as other things in life, you know, with education, employment, um, communication with other people, and just find ways that they can better themselves and make a successful life for them mm -hmm. to live through. And Marnie, is uh, this uh, type of story like Maria's kind of, have you heard that before where someone might, you know, come to YouthLink and it might not work out at first, but then more circumstances and they, they're, you know, back at your, at your door uh, looking, looking for some help. Absolutely. It's not, it's not rare for us to hear that at all. I think a lot of times when young people are experiencing homelessness, they have, um, they have become homeless because there have been adults in their life that maybe they should have been able to trust and they weren't able to trust. And so they just automatically have um, a barrier up with trusting mm -hmm. maybe different systems in the community or different adults in the community. And so we we understand that at YouthLink mm -hmm. and we meet young people where they're at. And so if you just want to check us out and kind of, you know, get your feet wet and see how it is, we're fine with that. A lot of times young people end up coming back. It may take two years, it may take six months, it may take a couple of days, but mm -hmm. we're always going to be there um, when you're ready to work on whatever it is that you need to work on. Mm -hmm. And Maria, how has uh, YouthLink uh, changed uh, your life over these past several months in working with them? Um, it's, it's changed a lot and I've, I feel like I depend on YouthLink, I mean, for a really good positive part of my life. Um, living at a shelter right now, at a youth shelter, it's, uh, it's for me, I'm, I t I'm a very, I, like kind of just going places, trying to get things done to move my life forward. Um, YouthLink is a way, especially in the AM drop-ins um, from like nine to two o'clock for people who live in a shelter who are between the ages of 21 to 23, can go in there, you know, take a shower and stuff. And for me, I use a lot of the resources in there. There are computer labs, the staff to talk to. Um, the staff are very just, outgoing different personalities. I mean, it's really fun to connect with them. So that's mm -hmm. one of like the basic, you know, resources that I use is to connect with the staff and just to feel really understood and loved and cared, whether it's through words or, you know, activities. Um, I also have used resources with, you know, Hennepin County trying to set up my, you know, GA or EBT food stamps. Um, there's other resources, like they have phones that are available for clients to use to co make calls to other shelters or calls to county workers if you don't have your own phone. Um, YouthLink staff are known as to be a case manager for individual youth. Um, with mine, I work with a youth that works with the issues that I go through. Um, individually, youth are assigned to those staff that best fits their personality and the issues that they're going through. And so it's really resourceful for me to always know that I have YouthLink to go to in the morning or in the evening through um, 3 p.m. to 8 p.m and just know that I can sit there if I just want to, just sit there, you know, watch TV, go on the computer, talk with somebody,
do activities or do whatever you want to do in there with reasonable limits, you mm -hmm. know. So, I mean, it's very resourceful. I find Youth Link something a very positive, just really it impacts me in a really good way in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll look back on it as I get older and just, you know, thank, be thankful that I had an opportunity center like that and people like that that were willing to actually listen to us and help us out. Yeah, if you... Um, if YouthLink didn't come into your life and you didn't have them as a resource, where do you think you'd be at today? Um, I will be honest. I would probably still be, you know, sitting in the same emotions that I've been sitting in. Um, I wouldn't be trusting a lot of people. I wouldn't be the type of person who's outgoing, trying new things. I would definitely be keeping to myself. Um, there's a lot of youth that do keep to themselves, and I think it's because of trust issues. And with YouthLink, having outgoing different, you know, barriers of different personalities with people and staff, it's a lot easier for us to open up with the issues that we've gone through or struggling through as of today. So, right. it's Wonderful. cool. And uh, Marnie, is there, uh, you know, <coughs> anything else you'd like to add just kind of about uh, these programs and, or just, you know, how, how, you know, the successes you've seen, I guess, over, you know, your period of time working with YouthLink? Sure. I'm, I mean, I think that there, there's countless um, success stories that we've mm -hmm. seen, and sometimes we don't always get to see those successes. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes um, we, we just sprinkle little seeds, mm -hmm. and then um, every couple of years we have somebody come back and say, you know, it was really great that I was able to get my GED at YouthLink, or it was really great that um, you were able to help me um, with my independent living skills, and now I have my own apartment, and I'm, on, I'm in college. I think... Um, the young people that come through our doors are really resilient, and I think sometimes um, hearing how successful they've become as they become adults is one of the greatest privileges of working there okay. and getting to spend time with these young people. Well, I want to thank you both for coming in, Marnie Thomas and Maria Zerbe. Thanks for sharing your uh, stories with us. Maria, thank you for uh, telling us a little bit about your life and how YouthLink has helped you. And uh, we appreciate you coming in and sharing with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for watching this edition of the Youth Intervention Journal. Remember, you can always get more information about this program or any of the programs here at North Metro TV by visiting our website, which is just simply northmetrotv.com. I've been, I'm Ben Hale, and I want to thank you once again for watching.